So the title of the paper is called A Deep History of the Social Contract. Um, and my question is, where did the idea of a social contract come from? And how might its unique history shed new light on its meaning today? This is the question. So before it's often cited, quote, first appearance in Hobbes, uh, political philosophy, uh, Hobbes' political philosophy in the 17th century, the basic idea of a social contract, um, let's turn off this Wi-Fi. Uh, the, the basic idea of a social contract is already described in Indian and Greek philosophers. Uh, the second century BCE Indian Buddhist book, uh, the Mahavasta, writes that, quote, as men lost their primeval glory, distinctions of class arose, and they entered into agreements with one another, accepting the institution of private property and the family. With this theft, murder, adultery, and other crime began. And so the people met together and decided to appoint one man from among them to maintain order in return for a share of the produce of their fields and herds. He was called the Great Chosen One, and he received the title of Raja because he pleased the people, end quote. So there's one early source. Plato later wrote that once men suffer injustice, they, quote, think that they had better agree among themselves to laws and mutual covenants and affirm it to be the origin and nature of justice. Similarly, Epicurus wrote that, quote, there never was such a thing as absolute justice, but only agreements made in mutual dealings among men in whatever places at various times providing against the inflection or suffering of harm, end quote. Okay. But, and I'm not gonna go on, there's more, but I'm not gonna go on. It's just to say there's a long history here. Uh, but we, we can trace the idea of the social contract. Uh, can we go any earlier um, than the Greeks? Um, as far as I know, and I looked thoroughly as, as well as I could, and I'm, I'm happy to learn more, but I couldn't find anybody who had traced this any further back than the Greeks. Uh, in part because at a certain point, we're no longer dealing with texts, and it's out of the domain of many political philosophers and humanists who deal in texts. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody has tried. And you're sort of you're dealing more with comparative linguistics and archaeology, um, and you're on a little bit more shaky ground. Yet in recent years, these disciplines have yielded findings that make it possible to say something new about the earliest history of the social contract. That's what I'm gonna share with you today is some of these early findings that might connect, uh, uh, give us some link to earlier versions of the contract. Um, linguists have spent the last century and a half of comparing language structures in order to reconstruct how they might've emerged uh, and relate to one another. One of the greatest achievements of their effort has been the widely celebrated reconstruction of a system of Proto-Indo-European root words from which all Indo-European languages are derived. More than half of the language spo languages spoken today around the world are Indo-European languages, including Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, in which we find all the oldest texts about the social contract. More recently, linguists have used these roots to locate uh, the region of the world where they likely emerged and spread out through Eurasia. And I can't give you the whole all the thing, all the evidence that they've gathered to support the, this particular conclusion, but I'll tell you that it's it's not consensus, but it's near consensus in, in archaeolinguistics. Um, for example, there's no proto-Indo-European root for palm trees, but plenty of grass and domestic animals. So the, the so words that are connected with domestic animals and grass. So by indexing root meaning to known climate technologies and geographies, linguists and anthropologists have narrowed down the possible location of root words. There's ongoing debate about the exact location of the earliest proto-Indo-European language, but the range of dates and places debated has narrowed significantly in recent years due to technological advancements in genetics. Um, I can't get into the details, so I'll just tell you today uh, that one of the most widely held views among archaeolinguists is that the Proto-Indo-European roots first emerged in the open grasslands north of the Black Sea in modern-day Ukraine around 3500 BCE. The most widely cited and off and respected summary of this view and the evidence is the 2000 book, The Horse, the Wheel, and Language, written by the anthropologist David Anthony. Anthony's view, not without its critics, also remains largely consistent with the, with, uh, with the most recent 2022 genetic evidence. Um, however, in drawing on linguistic, uh, linguistics, I'm not proposing the etymological fallacy that just because we know the Proto-Indo-European root of the English word contract, 
that this means necessarily uh, that we know what its true original meaning is. Um, that's not the claim I'm making. Word meanings are constantly shifting and not necessarily tied to their root meanings, but sometimes they are. Um, so what are the earliest Proto-Indo-European root words related to the social contracts? And what were the geographical, cultural, and archaeological beginnings of the idea like? If we know what culture area the idea came from, we can look at the anthropological evidence and see how uh, and in what context some of the earliest Proto-Indo-Europeans uh, may have used the word, um, words that related to contract. Then ultimately, if there's a resemblance, we can see how it relates to later Indo-European incarnations of this idea in India, Greece, England, and France. Specifically, as a philosopher, I was curious whether we might see certain social and metaphysical assumptions about society and nature in the earliest ideas of a social contract. These assumptions may have been transmitted through Indo-European languages into ancient and modern philosophies. I assume that the idea of a social contract as developed uh, in this Indo-European tradition is not universal among all peoples, places, and times. Like everything, the idea of the social contract, it was born somewhere, spread out, and will die. But in hopes of exposing some of its deepest roots of the idea, um, I was looking and hope to expose some of the most widely held philosophical assumptions uh, of the Indo-European influenced peoples. So on the one hand, origins of the idea and then philosophical assumptions within the idea. But before starting my tentative conclusions here, uh, let's first look at how some of the earliest social contracts may have worked in Proto-Indo-European culture. 5,000 years ago, in the purported grassy birthplace of Indo-European languages, the archaeological and anthropological record shows the presence of a culture area called the Yamnaya culture. Candidates for the inventors of the wheel, the chariot, and the earliest domesticated horses, the Yamnaya were nomadic pastoralists. They were even one of the first in Eurasia to live almost entirely off domestic animals. In this way, the Yamnaya invented a distinctly different way of life than the hunter-gatherers and farmers around them. Ruminants converted grass, inedible, to humans into wool, felt, clothing, tents, milk, yogurt, cheese, meat, marrow, bone. This shaped their society and values in unique ways. As the anthropologist David Anthony writes, quote, cattle and sheep herds can grow rapidly with little luck. Vulnerable to bad weather and theft, they can also decline rapidly. Herding was a volatile boom-bust economy, and it required a flexible, opportunistic social organization. Because cattle and sheep are easily stolen, unlike grain crops, cattle-raising people tend to have problems with thieves, leading to conflict and warfare. Under these circumstances, brothers tend to stay close together. Stock breeding also created entirely new kinds of political power and prestige by making possible elaborate public sacrifices and gifts of animals. The connection between animals, brothers, and power was the foundation on which new forms of male-centered ritual and politics developed among Indo-European speaking societies." End quote. In a society based almost entirely on animal husbandry, the highest social value was the accumulation of mobile wealth. Unlike hunting, gathering, and agriculture, increasingly large herds of domesticated animals need to, ex uh, need to expand over large territories. In this way, stock herding is fundamentally expansionist. Some societies can also accumulate wealth in the form of animals, well beyond, uh, oh, such societies, uh, well beyond what can be eaten immediately or stored over the winter. In this way, step herding could rapidly out accumulate foragers and farmers and be less susceptible to uh, seasonal changes. Yamnaya step herding was also distinctly more individualistic in character than farming and foraging which were fundamentally collectivist. Herding only required one man on horseback to manage relatively large flocks. The problem, as Anthony describes it, was that mobile wealth, such as horses and cattle, were easily stolen by other individuals, especially using fast horses. Individuals, then, are solely responsible for their herds and solely to credit for their success. Anthony speculates that, quote, pre-Iron Age warfare in the Eurasian steppe from what we can glean from sources like the Iliad and the Rig Veda, probably emphasized personal glory and heroism, end quote. However, when individuals lost their animals, they had to borrow more from other individuals uh, who still had them. Anthony continues, quote, 
the social obligations associated with these loans are institutionalized among the world's pastoralists <clears throat> as the basis for a fluid system of status distinctions. Those who loaned animals acquired power over those who borrowed them, and those who sponsored feasts obligated their guests. Early Proto-Indo-European uh, included vocabulary about verbal contracts bound by oaths, used in later uh, religious rituals to specify the obligations between the weak, humans, and the strong, the gods. Reflexes of this root were preserved in Celtic, Germanic, Greek, and Tokarian. Thus, okay, end quote. Thus, it is no coincidence that when domesticated cattle, sheep and goats first became widespread on the steppe, a system of debt, uh, debt and credit emerged, which in turn gave birth to the first Yemnaya chiefs. Furthermore, the rise of prestigious and wealthy individuals created increasingly male-centered and uh, patrilocal social hierarchies. According to Anthony, quote, no such ostentatious leaders had existed in the old hunting and gathering bands of the Neolithic, end quote. And another quote, uh, as leaders acquired followers, political networks emerged around them, and this was the basis for tribes. Societies that did not accept the new herding economy became increasingly different from those that did. End quote. Steppe societies were so profoundly different than surrounding peoples that most of the farmers and foragers who encountered the Yamnaya continued to refuse to adopt herding for thousands of years. Anthony suggests this was likely for moral, social, and economic reasons. Quote, foragers genu genu uh, generally value immediate sharing and generosity over miserly saving for the future. So the shift to keeping breeding stock was a moral as well as an economic one. It probably offended the old morals. It is not surprising that it was resisted or that when it did be uh, begin, it was surrounded by new rituals and a new kind of leadership or that the new leaders threw big feasts and shared food when the, when the deferred investment paid off. These new rituals and leadership roles were the foundation of Indo-European religion and society, end quote. In this way, Indo-Europeans had distinctly different cultural values and beliefs from everyone else around them. One of the distinct beliefs was the idea of social contracts. Anthony reports, quote, Proto-Indo-European institutions included the belief in the sanctity of verbal contracts bound by oaths, uh, oit oitos, I'm not sure exactly, or maybe nobody's exactly sure how to pronounce it, or European root words, but uh, O-I-T-O-S. Um, and in the obligation of patrons or gods to protect clients or humans in return for loyalty and service, end quote. Those who, had, uh, to, those who had lost cattle and had to borrow had to give up their freedom to accumulate for themselves in exchange for the chief's protection from the dangers of nature and other brutish men who might steal their cattle. Then, as herds grew and leaders acquired more followers, political networks emerged around them, and this was the basis for tribes. But as the tribes grew, so did competition between regional leaders called uh, POTUS meaning, quote, owner, master, host, husband. Those were all the meanings of that Indo-European root potis, P-O-T-I-S. And as the whole Yamnaya culture grew and spread out, it increasingly came into contact with foragers and farmers with whom they made similar patron-client contracts, as Anthony describes it, quote, the mechanism through which the immigrant chief made himself indispensable to the villagers and, try, and tried to... Uh, um, and tied to him was the creation of a contract in which he guaranteed protection, hospitality, and the recognition of the villagers' rights to agricultural production in exchange for their loyalty, service, and their best land. Yamnaya herding groups needed more land for pastures than did farming groups for equal po of equal population. And this could have provided, this is all very long quote from Anthony still, uh, a rationale for the Yamnaya people to claim use rights over most of the available pasture lands and the migration routes that linked them, eventually creating a web of land ownership that covered much of southeastern Europe. The migrating Yamnaya chiefs then organized islands of authority and used their ritual and political institutions to establish control over the lands they appropriated from uh, for their herds which required granting legal status to the local populations nearby under patron-client contracts." End very long quote. With enormous tribes, herd, huge herds, and high mobility also came the need to adjudicate relationships among tribes. This too uh, was, uh, Anthony pr pr proposes, 
was done with patron-client oaths and contracts based on the Proto-Indo-European idea of mutual obligations, hosti, G-H-O-S-T-I. That's the Indo-European root, meaning guest, host, stranger, enemy. Indeed, the English word hospitality comes from the Proto-Indo-European roots, hosti and potis, mm -hmm. referring to the contractual oaths where a master owner, husband, offers his protection to those who temporarily or permanently give up their right of individual accumulation. Here's another quote from Anthony. This mutual obligation to provide hospitality functioned as a bridge between social units, tribes, and clans that had ordinarily restricted these obligations to their kin or co-residents. Guest-host relationships would have been very useful in a mobile herding economy as a way of separating people who were moving through your territory with your assent from those who were unwelcome, unregulated, and therefore unprotected. The guest host institution might have been among the critical identity defining, identity defining innovations that spread with the Yamnaya horizon, end quote. Okay, that's the end of the quotes and background on Indo-Europeans. Um, and their uh, sort of anthropology. Now, last section on some philosophical conclusions about what I think all of this means for thinking about the social contract. Okay, what does all this about the Amnaya culture have to do with the social contract? Let's sum up and get to the philosophical, uh, some, some tentative conclusions and then some open questions for discussion. Yamnaya political culture was based on a series of oath contracts and host obligation, host guest obligations as a unique response to their particular geographical mode of production based on high risk, high yield, mobile, stealable wealth accumulation. Their particular pastoralism also contributed to a culture of profound social inequality, hierarchy, patriarchy, and individualism, which they institutionalized through the social contracts among men and tribes. They raised enormous burial mounds dedicated only to powerful individuals buried alongside their material wealth and symbols of male power. Meanwhile, nearly uh, the rest of the continent had relatively egalitarian burials with fairly humble grave goods. Here are, uh, at that time, here are my tentative philosophical conclusions about what I think this means. One, the core idea of a social contract, like from its historical roots, is at least as old as the Yamnaya culture and has the following character. So I think even if it's different, we, we can track different variations, maybe the roots of it go at least back this far to these Indo-European, early Indo-European cultures. Okay, this is maybe too far of a generalization, but I'm just gonna throw it out there as a possible generalization about what all of these Indo-European cultures share in common. Nature and other humans are fundamentally dangerous and unpredictable. Your brother may steal or kill from you to accumulate. Maybe this is one of Rousseau's caveats. People are good, but sometimes they're bad. Um, other men are individually, and here emphasis, you can't see the italics in the paper, but men in italics, individually in italics, responsible for their own success or failure. They may become heroes and chiefs through the, their accumulation of mobile wealth and gain power through loyalty contracts, or they may fail and starve. It's them, it's on them. Accordingly, the best way to handle this dangerous situation is to agree with your brothers as individuals to make an oath contract with one another through a more powerful protector, but you lose your freedom to disobey and must share your wealth. Okay, so that's one maybe overarching thing going on in lots of Indo-European cultures. Um, conclusion, tentative conclusion two, not all Indo-European peoples uh, were or are pastoral nomads, but they have all been deeply influenced by the philosophical assumptions of the Yamnaya. Hobbes's anxiety about the state of nature and our refuge in a Leviathan is one iteration of a basic Yamnaya contract to the chief. Rousseau's description of individual assent to a social contract, and Rousseau makes a big deal about the sovereign being a real person. He's a real person, even if it's not a real person, we have to think about it like a real person. Why? Maybe because the original social contracts were about real, real people. Um, and there's some legacy of really needing the concreteness of that protector. Modern variations of the social contract based on individual assent accept a 5,000 year old assumption that society is made of free individuals. Um, ancient Greek attempts to understand the social contract in terms of reason, law, or justice may have only been attempts to universalize and dress up one very particular geographically specific philosophical assumption. Um, 
And then the Greeks think it's some essential human feature when maybe it's not. Across Indo-European influence cultures, we can find core assumptions that valorize hierarchy, patriarchy, and variations of individualism and accumulation. Indeed, accepting these assumptions is so close with accepting the social contract itself that the oaths that used to be performed explicitly for the Yamnaya um, and maybe early Indo-European cultures are now implicitly uh, assumed in Indo-European influenced cultures. Okay, third, third short conclusion. The above philosophical assumptions of a social contract are at the heart of many and perhaps all of the criticisms scholars have made of the idea of the social contract, which there are many, uh, including its exclusion of women, migrants, and indigenous people. Okay, so those are some tentative conclusions we can debate. Last three questions and then I'm done. Um, is there any version of the social contract or any, any version of a social contract that's worth using that avoids these linguistic philosophical assumptions passed down by the Yamnaya? So is it possible to change the meaning of this today and what would that be like? Question two, are there any non-Indo-European influenced social contracts? My hypothesis would be no, but I would want to hear what you all think. Um, if there are um, non-Indo-European social contracts, I think that we should probably expect to find similar philosophical uh, and social assumptions at work. Um, but it seems unlikely to me only because foraging and farming societies tend to have really different um, modes of production and therefore different philosophical assumptions that would not lead them to come to the conclusion of a social contract. Um, but I don't know this for sure. It's an, it's, it's an open question. Um, question three, what non-Indo-European alternatives to the social contract might help us overcome certain philosophical assumptions baked into the Indo-European contract? Okay, thanks. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just Stephanie on Zoom, if you do want to ask a question, do do please indicate. Um, and if nobody happens to be watching at a particular moment, just just so sort of put your microphone on and go for it. I don't want you to be sort of disadvantaged by being uh, being online. Um, let, let me ask the, the first question if I could to get us going, uh, and then I'm, I'm sure there'll be more uh, around the table as well. Um, I, I want to pick up on one of your final questions, Thomas, you know, to, to what extent might there be a non-Indo-European version of it, um, and inflect that slightly differently, which is to, to what extent is the social contract, whatever we understand by that term, a, in a sense, a genus or a species. So it, to what extent should that language, or is that language inevitably tied to what gets labeled the social contract sort of post hoc? Or to what extent is that one particular species of a genus that, that is not sort of tied to that language, you know, such that the, the Yamnai have one example of this, Hobbes is another example of this, but there's a this that it is an example of. Um, and put in mind of a book by a guy called Kim uh, Sterlnik, The Pleistocene Social Contract. So the, the, the argument there is that there's cooperation develops in, a, in, in Pleistocene society in a way that is unusual previous to that position where that, that moment where everybody is, is essentially fighting against each other is the argument of the book. Um, and so the the idea there will be cooperation is the key sort of concept. And then any, any moment where humans cooperate can be called a social contract, there are different versions of it. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to think through in my own head is what is specific about the modern social contract that, it's, that it can be differentiated from this broader genus of people are cooperating together. Is, is there anything unique about that? And then I guess that links into to your question of are there non-Indo-European versions of this? Um, yeah, so I, I'm not quite sure how that comes out as a question, but that's a, that's a brain dump in, in relation to what you're saying that, that I, I, I invite you to respond to should you wish. No, thanks, Chris. That's, that, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot there, I'm sure. Um, and I, I have maybe more follow-up questions, but um, I, I and I, I don't know this the book the Pleistocene social contract and 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 what's at stake there. 
I mean, my, 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 if we're looking for some kind of evidence, I wonder what the evidence of this book is going to be. Um, that be, the reason I stopped at the Yamnaya was because that's the kind of linguistic beginnings where you can still say it's tied to texts where we can see the contract spelled out and that's connected with the linguistic roots. If you're just going to go far back, so far back that you're dealing purely with archaeology, I think you're in much more speculative. So I'm open to hearing what it is, but I feel like the moment you've like stepped outside of that of the linguistic and like some really direct linguistic tie, you're in a bit more speculative territory that I I would be cautious, and I want to hear more about what that means. Um, for for my my tentative answer is. I think the best evidence, and even then some people might say, well, that's still not, that's still too weak. I, I need more text. I want a text that spells out those contracts. Okay, well, we're not going to get that. So this is just what we're dealing with. But we're dealing with the linguistic roots of those things. So, you know, it's it's not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot more than just bones in a pit. Um, so uh, that's the, I mean, that's maybe the second question is, are, well, and actually that's maybe not even the answer to the two questions. The two questions that I understood was, the first one is what's different about the modern version and maybe the, diff the difference in the modern one and other people probably would maybe know better than me, but my understanding is I think it would be a certain, the, the species of the genus, okay? So I tried to give the description of the genus, which is these general features about a kind of hostile nature, hostile other humans. What do you do in that context where you've assumed that everybody are individuals, that there is a hierarchical and, 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 and patriarchal structure like that's that I think that's the genus the species of the modern version and I think even there's the ancient versions there's a tendency toward emphasizing reason bigger ideas justice reason you're like come on I mean you're doing the same stuff that the Yamnaya were more or less but you're going to now phrase it in terms of well it's because we use universal reason and and people who don't use universal reason won't be able to come to this and that will include lots of non-Indo-European uh societies who, had, who it were not influenced indigenous traditions that are like we have ways to do this that have nothing to do with the contract nothing to do with reason we don't need to justify this by universal justice and god you know what i'm saying so i think that the modern version and emphasis for hobbes is like and rousseau it's human reason that 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 brings us to just the logical conclusion of it all and i think that is the species that's like you don't have to have reason be the key and the yamnaya did it i don't think um the re like the, the Indo-European roots, the emphasis was not on divine justice or reason in that same way. It just, it was, it had to do with the mode of production and, uh, uh, you know, certain assumptions about men and individualism and, and nature. Um, so I think that's, that would be my short answer again. I hear what other people say. Reason, um, that's, that becomes a later articulation. And then the next one is, are there non-Indo-European influenced versions of the social contract? So what I what I what I would say is if um, my my guess is no, and I, again I'm open to hearing what they would be, but based on the genus, I'm not like I don't I do wonder if all of the species will still be part of that genus, and by genus I mean they accept the philosophical core assumptions of that were there already with the Yamnaya at base, whatever we dress it up as and say it's reason, it's justice, whatever. Um, if we found other cultures that 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 were uninfluenced by Indo-Europeans, which gathering that evidence is also quite difficult. And I don't want to make it sound like, oh, we'll just go look. I mean, it's much harder to gather that kind of evidence. Linguistic, textual, or even historical and philological is quite complicated. But um, my guess would be, I don't think we would find genus or even any species of the social contract. There's lots of ways to think about social relations and the contract is only one that happens to be dominant in Indo-European influenced cultures and with the history of colonialism is, is in part how that spreads. Both, both ancient versions of colonialism and modern versions of colonialism uh, is how that narrative spreads. Okay, anyway, that's too long of an answer. Thanks though, well, to be continued, yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have something on this before we move to a different issue? Flora? Yes, actually, um, <clears throat> so thank you so much. Um, and I had a question regarding Rousseau, because I think the main difference between the type of social contract, you know, archaic social contracts you described, and the kind of social contract Rousseau theorizes, is that Rousseau very heavily emphasizes that his social contract is not 
a contract between the rulers and the people. That's uh, that's the point, you know, that's the whole point of chapter 17 of book three of the social contract. Whereas I think um if I understood if I got correctly what you the kinds of uh, contracts you described were more um packs of subjection, you know, um back to uh, back to, um subjectiveness. <laughs> so yeah, that was my that was my, the point that I wanted to make. Um, so my I guess my question was how could you um connect this kind of archaic contracts with the modern contract given that big difference? Mm -hmm. You're right. I think you're absolutely right that in Rousseau, the difference seems bigger than it is with Hobbes. With Hobbes, it's much more, I think, like a more direct connection. With Rousseau, it's still there, but Rousseau does, he changes it a little bit, but it ends up in the same place, which is to say that it's because ultimately for the Yamnaya, so when they're making contracts, even though you're right, they're, they're making them originally with the chief uh, to, to get cattle back, they, by, by multiple people engaging with the contracts with the chief, they're entering into these indirect contracts with one another because now they're loyal to the same chief and are now working on the same team effectively to provide cattle for the chief. Mm -hmm. um, so they collectively give up that individuality. So you're right that it's the, the, the route is slightly different, um, but the conclusion is more or less the same, which is all of those individuals end up, and Rousseau is clear on this point that the sovereign is treated like a person. Um, and so the contract, even though it's not directly with the sovereign, because that's not, I mean, he thinks that the, the result essentially is a collective contract in service to the, to a sovereign who is like a distinct person. Yeah. So I, so I think it's an indirect version that, that ends up fulfilling the same goal, which is there is a sovereign. And then there are the people who have contracted with that sovereign, even though with Rousseau, they contract first with themselves, then the result is the sovereign. Do you want to? Yeah, I, I was just wondering what what's the exact quote you had in mind when you say that Rousseau thinks of the sovereign as one person. Oh yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't have it in front of me. Because right in my reading, the sovereign is a collective character. Yeah. That we all sovereigns, which is slightly different than being subjected to one ruler. That's yeah. No. Yeah. Idea. No. We we would have to look at the passage, and I'm, I totally I didn't I didn't cite the passage in here, but there is. I do have a passage in mind, but it's I don't have a quote for it exactly. But thank you. We should look at that. Yeah. I have my skepticism. I could spend hours just on that question. Uh, no, I mean that's and that's not even in Hobbes, right? We do we the social contract is all or none. It cannot be contracted with the sovereign. The sovereign is produced out of it. And so it's an egalitarian principle whereby all the people are sovereign. There is the production of an executive branch whereby the sovereign will be also be subject, but that is to be like a, a public uh, role, uh, a role that the association is to mitigate. Uh, otherwise, one hasn't understood a, a, a thing of Rousseau in his political theory. Um, there is our moments. I did a lot of work on Rousseau and sovereignty. Uh, it was my dissertation. So <laughs> um, so I might have a couple of quotes in mind myself. Yeah. And um, no, in fact, like you could look to the teacher role, the Lysurgis like role of the educator in part three of the social contract. You could start to talk about civic religion. You could push it and pull it. But uh, um, but. That's not a fair reading of Rousseau, at least to begin with. But I'll leave that aside. Um, I I wonder about this ultra ultra Heideggerian. It's even it takes Heidegger and triples down for this <laughs> linguistic determinism, whereby anybody who speaks Indo-European is caught within a thinking of the social contract, right? Whereas Heidegger says, well, we learn to speak Plato in a sense, and then we are Platonist ever after, and we can't escape, and then the event will come. In your account, as long as we're speaking to European, there's no hope. You said it might end, but as far as you can go back forever that we've been speaking, at least as Indo-Europeans, uh, we would be caught within that contract. I have my skepticism, not, not least because I don't know if there is an Indo-European history. I, I'm, I'm with Rousseau here. When Rousseau talks about his history as hypothetical, when David Graeber does his archaeology in his most recent book on egalitarian uh, early societies. He doesn't put much stock in the Indo-European uh, idea either. It's a racist history. The whole production of the idea of an Indo-European origin to the West <coughs> is a eugenicist project to trace the origin of our languages to a specific racial group on the steps between Europe 
in these grasslands that are in modern day you can i come off really strong but you can't come off stronger than what it was a nazi science right uh uh john paul de, de Mule has a book out uh in translation from oxford university press this year which does great work um i think of destroying Dan david anthony's work right david anthony by the way you can go one further his whole idea of an oath most scholars who look at it are very skeptical. They think actually these were warlike tribes. They didn't have any idea of oh, this was all. It was a lot of violence. There's no. He really has to uh, cherry pick this whole idea of an oath. But leave that aside. This whole notion of the Indo-European commonality, an ethnic group that was on the grassland, that then through a biological linguistic determinism will then determine our idea of the social project far more powerfully than I don't know. My own paper last year on the YouTube network was specifically about what does the social mean in 17th, 18th centuries? What's the contract mean? Contract means something very different in the 17th century, right? If we move from the scholastics to the 17th century, to the 19th century, to the 21st, we know contracts have vastly changed. We're all clicking them constantly. So you know they've changed, right? So why would, why would I learn more going back to a hypothetical history of Indo-European culture for, a, for the social contract, right? Why would that, and, and why not more misgivings on the hypothetical? Because it's Rousseau, what, what Rousseau is worried about is naturalizing a specific social order. But in a way, you're caught within that circle because the moment you say, David Anthony says, Indo-European culture has this hierarchy and, he, and essentially, if we speak Indo-European, we have that social hierarchical social contract then you're caught within the problem that David Anthony speaks in an Indo-European language, and of course he's going to find it because that's the language he speaks. It's a circular it's a circular reasoning that if David Anthony was a better philosopher, he would have caught, right? But if that's the claim, but I don't think that's his actual claim, because that kind of determines it. But maybe you can help me out, because that's the really so, that's the really so person to me, is to be uh, skeptical of these origins. Um, and that's why, yeah, it's a, uh, the discourse is a hypothetical, um, program. Yeah. Um, thanks. That was that was a lot, Peter. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm actually hungry and caffeinated. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could tell. It's a, it's a <laughs> My partner knows not to deal with me that. Long. So there's a lot. There's a lot going on there, and I'll try to respond to as many as I can. But my guess is we're going to continue to talk about these themes. Mostly, I think that you've misinterpreted what I'm saying about it on on all the points. But let me. But it's. But they're fine. I mean, it's not like they're outrageous misinterpretations. Some of them are quite common. But anyway, the first one is about Heidegger. So and and linguistic determinism. I'm very much not saying. And in the paper, that was one of the first things I said. I am not saying that just because an older language says X or the roots say X, it necessarily determines what we mean now or at any point in history. But That's the, the first end, thing that I said. You so. did, and I caught that. All but right. at the end of the paper, you did suggest, and I might have been wrong, um, but I thought you were coming back to as long as in a Europe, there's a common notion of a social contract within Indo-European culture. I thought that, did I miss it? Did I that statement? So, if, if it's a Russo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if there is, so this is a hypothetical and right. conclusion. If there is, then there is. I mean, I'm just saying there doesn't have to be, but if there is, we find it and it's there. So it could, so, so languages can diverge, languages can do other things, but also they cannot, and they can very much fall into the same older meanings that they had before. So the question is, do they, and the paper was to say, and it's a very short paper, we need more evidence to do any of this stuff than I can give you in 25 minutes, was to say that I think there are a lot of commonalities and there's enough to say that there is. Again, that has nothing to do with determinism. And for and it also has nothing to do with Heidegger either. I well, I, I have a thesis of a, of a linguistic determinism. Right? But this is not a but look, it is not a linguistic determinism. I just told you exactly how it's not a linguistic determinism. Mm -hmm. You can easily use it's not like just by touching an Indo-European root and anything linguistic leads you to determinism. That's ridiculous. A determ maybe we misunderstood. So what I mean by determinism is, is exactly when you said something like to speak Indo-European. Well, that means someone who doesn't speak Indo-European, that's why the whole search for your people is what about there needs the whole question of if it's not Indo-European, they would have a different social contract, which means there's a social contract implicit to the it speaking Indo-European. 
I'm, it doesn't mean point. there has to be. It means that we can find it. it is possible, yeah. and we can, and to the degree to which we can find it, it's but, there. But the only, that the premise of those time. But the premise of the question would be that there is a contract implicit to your Indo-European. Otherwise, you could search for it. Well, of course, but I that's what I'm One more question. We'll just have one, one more response. Right. And then we'll Thanks. That was great. Thank you. I, did, I actually like it a lot. So. OK, well, we'll continue to talk more about it. Also, it is like the history of, well, whatever, the whole thing about the racism thing. Like, there are ways to think about Proto-Indo-European cultures that have nothing to do with racialized agendas. You're right that they have historically, but that should not lead us to throw out all of archaeolinguistics just because the beginnings of it had to do with Nazism. The conclusions have nothing to do with Nazism or nationalism, it, even if the methodologies of the people who did it. I mean, like that's true of so many sciences, but you don't throw out entire sciences and studies of linguistic and history and archaeology just because some Nazis did some similar things. Like you should be, we should be absolutely critical, but there's no reason to throw it all out. And I think that's what that recent book in translation, I forget the author, but I read the, I mean, I read sections of that book and that's that like, that's the whole argument of, I'm forgetting the French guy's name. Didn't mention. Cool. Yeah. So I think that, I think his argument is way too dismissive of an entire field. I don't think he decimates Anthony's argument. I think that he just. He offers evidence. It's not just a claim. Okay. All right. Well, we'll get to it. Let's, let's have squeezing one final question quickly if we could. Oh, I'll try to be as quick as possible. So I was going to raise that problem as well, especially mentioned Jim Azil, who mm -hmm. had this amazing work that inspired a whole generation of French thinkers, including Foucault, et cetera, but had you know, fascist allegiances, et cetera. So there is a problem there to come to terms with, which I think doesn't have to mean that we cannot look at Jim Azil carefully and extract some interesting uh, points. So, but the way I read your presentation in terms of method, uh, is more in terms of like a genealogy or a philosophical, even hypothetical history a la deleuze Guattari. Uh, you know, when they claim that the origins of the state uh, date back to Ur, right? I think that you're doing something similar when you're tracing the genealogy of the social contract to some kind of, even a, a genealogy, not a necessarily a factual history that can be sp spoken of hypothetically in, this, in the European um um, um, culture. So that's the first comment I had in terms of method. I, I do see there's a difference uh, in what you're doing from just attributing to the Indo-European some kind of factual origin of these things. Uh, the second uh, question I have is the difference between Indo-European, as you described them, being based, you know, contracts and hierarchy, patriarchy, individual accumulation, etc., and this relation between a sovereign and you know, a collective or a people that is protected by and responds to the sovereign. Um, other modalities of contracts. And I think in the Epicurean tradition, there are other modalities of contract um, that are distinguished from this kind of value you explained by its end goal, which is pleasure, mm. right? So I recently wrote this paper, which I called Organizing Collective Enjoyment. So, Basically, I think in the Epicurean tradition, you have some kind of maybe different story about you know, how you enter into contracts which assure that everyone enjoys you know, the pleasures of life. Right? Mm -hmm. So you, you create some kind of social mechanism to assure that there is some kind of equal distribution or fair distribution of pleasure among people. And, and finally, I had other things to say, but it's, I'm trying to make this very uh, concise. Other ideas of contract that are not in the European, well, maybe the Bible, right? So uh, there's this whole idea of the Brit, right? Which is the idea, the covenant, right? Which plays out between, of course, some kind of religious sovereign in a way, uh, but also has consequences in terms of social organization. That kind of first contract with the deity kind of um, proposes, organizes, grounds contracts between people political and social contracts um, in this world, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's that's a different story to be told, a different genealogy. Yeah, um, so in, in the case of the, so like the Semitic languages are definitely not Indo-European, but the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, when it's written, it has already been long influenced by Indo-European peoples mm -hmm. in the area. Um, so I would say that even though the language itself is not Indo-European, the culture itself had lots of Indo-European influence on it for, for hundreds and hundreds of years prior to any text that, that we would have. 
Um, and I also say just on the face of that, um, uh, that that very much does fit in in my mind at least where there's like there is a sovereign even if it's like divine you're right that's maybe slightly different than what we know about the Indo Euro the the Yamnaya they maybe didn't have like yet or at least maybe we're not sure entirely if they had a transcendent deity mm -hmm. um, but in the case of uh, of the Hebrew Bible it, like the deity just becomes a version of the chief mm -hmm. um, that the contract is with mm -hmm. um, so it becomes divine but and maybe there was already a divinity to it that's ambiguous. Uh, but the structure remain, remains more or less the same. On the question of Epicurus, um, I'd be interested to hear more. I do wonder how 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 different it is, or if just the substance is different. So instead of cattle, we're just dealing with like pleasure. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, or you know, like maybe maybe instead of cattle, it's pleasure, or maybe also in terms of maximizing pleasure for Epicurus, that kind of just like minimizing pain. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think I want to hear more about what you mean by like a um, like a contract that has to do with that that kind of pleasure, or if that would diverge, or if you think it would deserve, diverge so much from somebody like Rousseau. Even mm -hmm. in any case, yeah, good good questions all. Thank you. Let's thank thank you.